Hello, this is Professor Lenis. Welcome to Chemistry with Jose. Today we are going to do a short demonstration on how to make dry ice. Before we start, let's remember some safety precautions. We need to have the proper PPE, personal protection equipment, to work in a chemistry lab. Here we have approved safety goggles, disposable gloves, and lab coat. Button up. Let's start with the demonstration. Here we have a cylinder filled with compressed CO2. This is the device that's going to help us during the process. I'll start opening this bulb. And then I make sure this is locked and I will start opening this valve slowly and you, you will hear some noise. So this is decompressing from high pressure to atmospheric pressure. That also reduces the temperature. And CO2 gas will freeze, and that's what we call the dry ice. I have a homework for you. Do you remember how to call the process this physical state or physical process? when you change from solid to gas directly without passing through the liquid state. Do you remember that? Search. It's a homework. We need to do this in a slow process. It's going to take some... You will hear some noise. That means it's done. Now we close this bulb and open this one. Look, dry ice. This is what we call dry ice. This is just solid, pure CO2. Another question, what is the freezing point of dry ice right now, very cold. Let me tell you this, the freezing point is negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. How many Fahrenheit are those? So, two questions. First, what is the name of the physical change from solid to gas without passing through the liquid state? Notice that the dry ice is going to gas. Let me see if you can see it here. Can you see the gas there? And I don't see a liquid. There's no liquid. Directly from solid to gas. What is the name of the process? Close this one, we let this down and close the main bulb and it's ready for the next experiment. Thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next experiment. Hello, this is Professor Lenis, welcome to Chemistry with Jose. Today we are going to do another experiment. This experiment 
is experiment number one, chemical equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle. Let's remember the safety equipment we need. PPE, personal protection equipment. Safety goggles, approved to work in a chemistry lab. Safety gloves, lab coat. Full covered shoes. All right? So we are ready to start with the law of mass action and Le Chatelier's principle. We are going to demonstrate some physical equilibrium and some chemical equilibrium. Then in the lecture, I'll show you the shape of the law of mass action. Let's start with the first part. For this I have the assistance of Matthew. Matthew is going to help us following the step by step. Then I'll show you the results and you will fill the blanks. All right, Matthew. What is the first one? Step one. Chemical equilibrium using acid base indicators. Good. So acid base indicators will show us a beautiful chemical equilibrium that can be shifted to the right or to the left. Matthew? Step one. Using a graduated cylinder, add five millimeters of distilled or deionicized water in testing to a clean testing. Add two to three drops of crystal bottle in the Solution using Because cylinder, distilled water. So it says about 5 ml of about. We don't need, we don't need to be strict on this. Uh, in a clean test tube and then we have a few drops of crystal violet this is a solution of crystal violet okay. The name indicates the color of the solution. To use the white paper as background so we can see any color change easier. Just a couple of drops. You see, I'll do one more. We check it. There are different ways to check a solution or to dissolve a solid in a test tube. One way is this. You see? To make a homogeneous solution. And now you can see the color there. Crystal violet in water. What is the next step? Six molar hydrochloric acid solution. 
How many drops, Matthew? One drop. One drop. So we're going to add drop wise hydrochloric acid into our solution containing crystal violet. What is the new color? Write it down. All right, so what is next? Second drop of hydrochloric acid Let's see the color Any color change? Then it's getting lighter I just don't want to mention this color You need to observe and write the color drop of hydrochloric acid. Four drop. Interesting, right? Changing color. What color is this? Let's add one more drop. Okay. Changing color, definitely. It's turning to what color? Do you notice any color change there? Let's keep adding hydrochloric acid. Any color change? Yes. What color is that? It's turning into what color? Now we got definitely a color change. What color is this? Write it down. Next step. At three, at six, Here I have six molar sodium hydroxide solution. This is also clear colorless solution. This is the six molar hydrochloric acid also it is clear, colorless. Now we are going to add six molar sodium hydroxide solution to the test tube. So notice that the initial color was violet. light violet, we added hydrochloric acid and start to change color to this. And 
one to add one drop of sodium hydroxide solution. Now, two. Okay. More. Marine more. Sodium hydroxide solution to the test tube. Do you notice any color change? Let's keep adding drop wise sodium hydroxide until we see any color change. Oh, now we see a slight color change. I think it's turning back to the initial color. What do you think? How would you describe this color? Let's add more sodium hydroxide solution. To speed up the process, I'm just going to add three. What color is that? I think we are getting back to the initial color. It's like reversing the color change. Let's add more. I think that was the initial color we have before. So, conclusion. We have an acid-base process and we're shifting the solution given by color change. Shifting from right to left. So that's chemical equilibrium. And now you can answer the questions on your paper. What is the question? What can you conclude from your observations? What is the effect of adding the sodium hydroxide solution to the crystal violet solution? So based on your observations, you can solve the question. What is the next one? All right. So now the next experiment is also we are going to use an acid-base indicators. Acid-base indicators are very good to show the shifting of the equilibrium because they produce colorful solutions depending on the pH, depending if the solution is acidic or basic. So that change occurs just by adding protons to the solution. How do we add protons to the solution? Add hydrochloric acid. And then if you want to go to the opposite direction, remove protons from the solution. How do you remove protons from the solution? Add a base. In this case, we were using sodium hydroxide. So that way, you shift the equilibrium from right to left. Adding protons, removing protons. Remember, a proton plus hydroxide forms water. Um, if the specific indicator is in environment containing lots of protons produces one color. If the solution contains lots of hydroxides, so the indicator produces another color because they remove protons from the indicator. Let's go to the next one. The second step of our experiment is with metal red, another acid-base uh, equilibrium. 
Metal red is an acid base indicator, changes color depending on the pH of the solution. It shows red color in its acidic form and it shows yellow color in its basic form. So that's what we're going to do today. Removing the proton using sodium hydroxide and then putting back the proton using hydrochloric acid. Let's see what happened. Let's observe the color changes. And that will show the state of the equilibrium, the position of the equilibrium. <coughs> what is the first step, Matthew? Step one. We take red paint silver and color the ocean silver with dry ice water and green test. And two to three drops of purple red paint. About five ml of water in a clean test tube. Next. Let's add a couple of drops of metal red indicator. Let me show you the metal red solution. Two drops. Now you understand why it is called metal red. What is the color? Another question is, is this acidic form or basic form? Check the equation on your paper. What is the question on the paper? What is the color of the solution? That's given by the color. We know metal red is red in its acidic form and yellow color in its basic form. So we can say that here we have the acidic form. Next. Is the ratio of concentration MR negative over concentration HMR large or small? The color is showing the ratio. Which one is predominant? Red or yellow? That gives you the answer to the question. Next. At either HCI, 6 molar, or NaOH, 6 molar, to the solution dropwise, to change the color of the solution. Which one, HCR or NaOH? If you say this is the city form because chose the right color, you are absolutely right. So we should start removing this proton from here. How do you remove protons from the indicator? If your answer is adding sodium hydroxide, you're right. Let's see what happened. Let's add sodium hydroxide solution to remove protons here and to produce the basic form of metal red. We will know by the color change. added 
sodium hydroxide and look at the color. Did you expect this color? Remember, during the transition between red and yellow, in the solution you have some red molecules and some yellow molecules. So we have a mixture of these two. What is the color resultant of that mixture? Here is the color. Let's keep adding sodium hydroxide. one more drop of sodium hydroxide. Let's keep adding drop wise until we see any dramatic color change. I'm just adding some hydroxide to the solution and notice that the color is changing slowly. Let's keep adding sodium hydroxide until we observe a color change, a dramatic color change there. color change there. It's a little bit lighter. So write the color and fill the blanks. What is the question there? The solution changed color as you predicted. So you had your answer. Next one. Here we do a game. Did you notice we never never get the yellow color? Let's try again. This is the water plus few drops of metal red. The initial color is this. Nice red color. That shows that here we have the acidic form of metal red. Let's remove some protons from this indicator by adding sodium hydroxide solution. And let's see the color change. Beautiful. That's the color we were looking for. So I can con we can conclude that on the previous one, we never get the red color. I'll show you the yellow color. That's what we did again. How do we shift this basic form of metal red back to the acidic form, the red color form of metal red? If you said by adding protons, you are right. How do you add protons to the solution? Hydrochloric acid is the answer. Hydrochloric 
hydrochloric acid will add protons to the solution which is rich on hydroxide ions now will remove the hydroxide ions and then we'll have the base acid form of metal red again let's add hydrochloric acid Here we have the basic acid form of metal red again. Let's continue with part two of our equilibrium experiment. Chemical equilibrium of cobalt complexes. I have cobalt two chloride hexahydrate. Check on the guide how to write the formula of this compound. Again, this is cobalt 2 chloride hexahydrate. On this part, we are going to shift the equilibrium by adding water and adding heat or removing heat in the in our solutions and you can see how the equilibrium is shifted just by observing the color changes and following four equations you find in this step on your guide in every step you need to relate that to one of the equations on the guide depending on the color you observe so let's start with step number one. Place a few crystals of cobalt chloride hexahydrate into each of the three test tubes. So have the test tube rack here. Three test tubes. Right there. And I have the cobalt chloride right here and my spatula I want to get a piece of paper to clean the spatula few crystals of cobalt to chloride hexahydrate this formula contains six water molecules already in the structure look at the color of the crystal again this is the hexahydrate form of cobalt 2 chloride containing already six water molecules in its structure you can see the color even better here in this white background that's the original color red very nice dark red color so let's add a few crystals of this compound to each of these test tubes. Next. Add two milliliters of water to the first test tube, label the test tube H2O, and stir the test tube to dissolve the crystals into the solution. So 2 ml of water, about, I know about 2 ml of water is somewhere there.
we dissolve them you can see the color of the solution and we do the same thing same process with the other tubes Next. What is the color of this solution and what is the dominant species of cobalt in this solution? The color of the solution will tell you what is the dominant species and just use the equations I mentioned before. We have four equations. So check what is the color of the species here. Next. Add two milliliters of 12 molar HCl to the second test tube. Label the test tube HCl and stir the crystals to dissolve them into the solution. Second test tube. The first one contains just water. That's going to be our reference. I have a concentrated hydrochloric acid solution here, 12 molar. How many drops, Mike? Two milliliters. Oh, hydrochloric acid? Yeah. Oh. Okay. On this one, we need to be really careful. Again, this is concentrated hydrochloric acid. One full pipette makes two ml, approximately two ml of hydrochloric acid. Something like this. So let's add slowly to the solution. Put it here so you can see the color change, if any, you can tell. Remember, we always add concentrated acids to water slowly. Usually this additions are very exothermic and sometimes very violent. I put this away. Here it is after the addition and then I'm going to check the solution, check the test tube to make homogeneous solution there and also I can't tell you it's warm so that reveals that we have an exothermic process so what is the question here? What is the dominant species in the solution? Probably we need to add more. Hydrochloric acid. The blue on the bottom. Yeah, we have the blue. That means we need a little bit more of concentrated hydrochloric acid to keep the color. The final color. The final color didn't stay there all right now we got the color a permanent change there So we are shifting the equilibrium from one form into another 
and that is indicated by the color change. Now you can answer that question. The question was, what's the color? What is the dominant species in the solution according to the color? How do you know the color? So you can use the equations. The equations tell you what is the species that forms the blue color. It's a dark blue color. The next step is the third test tube and we are going to add still water slowly and stirring after each addition. What is the initial color? After few additions of water. This is the third test tube containing only a few crystals of cobalt to chloride hexahydrate. What does it say? It says so the end is still the Initial color of the crystals. And let's add water to this. It gets darker. I just add a few drops of water. And let's keep adding water to this until there's no more color change. So the color is getting lighter now because we are adding more water. It's getting diluted. Okay, so what is next? What is the dominant species of this solution? Again, in what equation you get this color by adding water? Next. Need a hot water bath, you don't have it. I had the hot water, but. Oh, you have it? Mm hmm. Okay. 
Here we go. Are you ready, Matthew? Now put the test tube into the hot water bath and observe the color of the solution. Same ter ter test tube. That's right. Let's put it in a hot water and let's observe if there's any color change in the solution when we put it in a higher temperature. Right now, this is room temperature. Probably we have around 21 degrees Celsius right here. Let's increase the temperature in the hot water and we are going to leave it here for a few minutes and then we come back to see if there's any color change there. Next. Next is you're supposed to put that into uh, an ice bath. Ice bath, all right. Steps five and six. We have the solution in hot water bath. And the next step will be putting a low temperature. That's why we have the dry ice here. While this is working, we go directly to step number seven. Then we go back to see the results on steps five and six. Step. step number eight. This is step number eight? eight yeah. Six and seven is over there, eight and nine is over there. All right, thank you. So this is step number eight. We take a few crystals of cobalt to chloride. We put it on a clean, dry test tube. Let's see the color of the crystals. Remember, those, this compound is already hexahydrated. It means contains six water molecules per formula in its crystal structure. We have only few drops of water to make sure it's thoroughly hydrated. So we can tell what is the color of cobalt-2 chloride in its hydrated form. That means containing water. Let's add just one or two drops of water to make sure it's completely hydrated. I'm not dissolving the crystals, they're just absorbing the extra water. You see the nice color, very dark color. You tell the color and write it down. And the next step, step nine, Mike, is taking the water out, right? Yes, you have to, using the test tube holder, heat the contents of the test tube using the Bunsen burner until you are satisfied that all the water has evaporated. First, we hydrated the compound. That means we added water to the one that it already had before. Now we are going to take the water out completely and you will see the change. And that process is called dehydrating. I'm going to use the Bunsen burner here and start heating slowly with the circular motions, you can see the color change immediately after we heat that. Let's keep on doing this. Remember, we need to remove all water from there. You can make an educated guess of what's the color of the final crystal, the dehydrated crystals. I almost remove cold water. Let's keep heating. I don't want water in that system. I 
and let's remove the condensed water that forms in the upper part of the test tube. And now we remove all the water from the compound. We have the dehydrated water. And we call this compound with no water the anhydrous form of the compound. So we have two forms. The hexahydrate, this one, dark blue, dark red, sorry, and we have the anhydrous form, no water, cobalt to chloride, anhydrous. What is the color? Let's hydrate this salt again by adding water. What is, you, what is the color you're expecting? What is your educated guess? What will happen with the color of the crystals once we add water? Let's see if you are right. What's the color you said? You're good. Next. It's almost there. So let's go back to experiments five and six. We place a few crystals of cobalt to chloride hexahydrate into a test tube. We just add a few drops of water. And we continue doing it until no color change. Then we place that in a hot water bath. And you can see it start turning blue color. Let's find what equation shows you the process. Adding heat, like right now, produces this color change. You can make your conclusions, you can find the equation there. Remember, we have four equations, and one of these equations is related to this process of adding heat or removing heat. Right now, we are adding heat to the initial solution. You will see the color change in the walls of the test tube, right there. Now, let's remove heat. How do you remove heat? Well, let's put it Okay, it changes color very quickly because once I take it out, it cools down very quick. So it color goes back to red. Let's put it on a cold bath. Here I have dry ice, very low temperature. Let's put it there and wait to see what happened with that solution. Part number three is solubility and complex ion equilibria of zinc and magnesium ions. All right. So we have two metal salts here, zinc nitrate and magnesium, magnesium sulfate, both forms a clear colorless solutions 
This is magnesium sulfate, clear colorless AQS solutions, both salts are dissolved in water. Uh, on this part of the experiment, I will recommend you check what is the position of zinc in the periodic table. We know this is a transition metal. So find out what is the position, group and period of zinc in the periodic table. Do the same thing for magnesium. This is another metal, but it's not a transition metal. What is the position of magnesium in the periodic table? You will see these two salts solutions will behave in a different way. So let's start with next step. Step number one. To each of three test tubes and two milliliters of 0.1 molar zinc nitrate. And to each test tube So let's start with three, three test tubes, and we are going to add how many ml? Two ml of zinc nitrate. Yes. On each one. Yes. colorless aqueous solution. Right, next. To each test tube add one drop of six molar sodium hydroxide and stir or mix. Sodium hydroxide, also clear colorless solution. One drop on each tube. One, one, one. And let's stir. Look what happened. It was clear colorless. Now, how do you describe this? This is what we call in chemistry a cloudy solution or milky solution. Uh, also, when I shake, I notice some stuff sticking in the inner walls of the test tube. I hope you can see it there. You see something is sticking there. So that means something new is there. It's definitely we have a chemical uh, process there. The color change to a milky and some sticky stuff over there. Uh, probably is a kind of uh, gelatinous uh, material. Let's add What goes on the second tube? Same? Sodium hydroxide. Same, yeah. So. All three test tubes are the same right now. Oh, I had it already, right? Yes. So here, same thing, we check it. And here we check it, we get the same thing. Cloudy, um, kind of gelatinous material there. Next. Step number two. To the first test tube, So let's see what happened with the material we have there. Adding hydrochloric acid. Remember, initially we added sodium hydroxide, now we are going to add hydrochloric acid. That's an acid based process that will remove some hydroxides there. Let's see what happened when we do that. Oh, now we have a clear colorless solution back. Let's add more to see if there's any 
for a change. And the solid or gelatinous materials have in the walls just disappear, that means dissolved. So I think we went back to the original condition of the solution and adding extra hydrochloric acid and nothing happens. Next. Initially, on the second test tube, we added only one drop of sodium hydroxide. The common sense tells you that if we add more, we should get even more dramatic change here, probably making more gelatinous material and getting milky. Let's see if that happens. Yes, we have more gelatinous materials and it's getting cloudy. What do you expect we keep adding this? You can say, oh, maybe we can get more gelatinous material and it's going to get really, really milky uh, solution. Maybe not. Let's see what happens. Look, we went back to the original solution. So what happened? It seems like this compound behaves in a way when we add few drops of the sodium hydroxide solution, but when we add an excess, it behaves in a different way. Can you explain that? Use the concept of formation of complex. Metal complexes. Next. To the third test tube, a six molar ammonium hydroxide, one drop at a time, with stirring or mixing. So here we have the slightly milky solution with some gelatinous material there. We are going to add, how many drops, Mike? Drop by drop. Uh, drop by drop. Of ammonium hydroxide solution. Also, is, it is clear, colorless solution. So we are adding ammonium ions here. Let's see what happened with this uh, metal in the solution, metal ion. Now we have a clear colorless solution. Let me add extra ammonium in the right? clear color, colorless solution. So it seems like uh, the complex just disappeared. Next. in this case magnesium sulfate which is a clear colorless solution and we are going to do exactly the same process as we did before. We want to leave it here so we can compare. So another three clean test tubes. We add about 2 ml of magnesium sulfate. On each test tube, and then 
to each test tube, we are going to add one drop of sodium hydroxide. To see what happened. One, one, one. And then we'll stir the solutions to see if there's any change. Here, remember, in this case we have magnesium sulfate. Also forms a milky solution with some solid inside. The formation of solids after uh, you combine two solutions means we have a precipitation process. Let's stir this one again, as we expected, it's milky, and formation of solid, precipitation. Same thing here, you can see the solid here, or the salt form. Now, to the first tube, we are going to add hydrochloric acid, drop-wise, to see what happens. Clear now. Let, let me add another drop of hydrochloric acid. Let's stir. And the solid just dissolved. And we have again the clear colorless uh, solution there. To the second tube, we add sodium hydroxide. Remember, initially we added only one drop of sodium hydroxide. Now we are going to add an excess of sodium hydroxide to the second tube. Slowly. One, two. This is still. Wow. Look. It's forming more solid. and it gets really milky. Let's add more. It gets more solid, more precipitation there. Let's keep adding sodium hydroxide solution here. It's getting wider. Milky, this is really milky solution, and it's getting thick. There's a lot of solid there. You can see there is really thick material there. Let's add more. I added a really excess of sodium hydroxide solution, and it gets really milky solution there. You see? You can compare to the sink. When we add an excess of sink, the excess of sodium hydroxide dissolves the initial uh, solid. Here, and this is magnesium, it forms more and more precipitate. To the third tube, we are going to add ammonium hydroxide. To the third Test two, we added a few drops of ammonium hydroxide. Let's add more. Look, it get cloudy and it forms some solid there. Let's add more. Yes, it's forming more precipitate and more on excess. Just keep on forming more precipitate. This is ammonium hydroxide solution. Let's add an excess of ammonium hydroxide and it forms 
even more precipitate there. So the precipitate doesn't dissolve. This time, we are going to work with copper to sulfate. Again, I will recommend check what is the position of copper in the periodic table. You should find copper in the transition metals part of the periodic table. And we are going to compare the behavior of copper to sulfate with the behavior of zinc we did it before and magnesium sulfate we did it before. We are going to use the same reagents. Let's see what happens. Let's see what is the behavior of copper. Maybe copper has a special behavior. Let's add about 2 ml of copper sulfate solution to each of these three test tubes. Let's see what is the color of the aqueous solution of copper to sulfate. You see a beautiful blue color there. The next step is adding only one drop on test tube one. And one drop on test tube two. Let's stir to see what happens. I see the formation of a solid there. Um, it's kind of gelatinous and precipitate there. Definitely forms a precipitate. You see on the bottom? of precipitate there. Let's see if the same thing happened on the second tube. You should look at here. Formation of precipitate and I see the big piece of precipitate on the bottom of the test tube. To the third tube we are going to add ammonium. And six molar ammonium hydroxide drop by drop and record what happens to the copper. This is the ammonium hydroxide. Clear, colorless solution. Has very special ammonium hydroxide, very special smell, characteristic of ammonium. Only one drop? Drop by drop. Drop by drop, okay. Like that. And you can see two rings there, two different blue colors there. The first one where you get the dark blue is the contact of the ammonium hydroxide with the solution. And I'm not checking it. Let's keep adding sodium hydroxide to the solution. And I'm going to check it and look. It forms a very thick precipitate there. And let's keep adding ammonium hydroxide to this. This dropper is not helping. After 
ester are in more ammonium hydroxide. I'm going to add more. Let's see if we can get it done here. And we got a nice dark blue look. Beautiful dark blue. Characteristic of the copper ammonium complex. I think this used to be called in the Middle Ages the like, uh, Prussian blue. Next, Mike. Just add one drop of ammonium hydroxide to test tube number two. Only one drop? Only one drop. We did it. And forms a precipitate. Oh, you did that? Yes. It forms a precipitate. And then I think we have to add more. You can add more if you want. Uh, Sodium hydroxide. Let's see what happens. To the second tube, let's add an excess of sodium hydroxide to the solution. And you can see we get even more precipitate. And we get like a gelatinous material there, very thick material there. Let me show you. This is with an excess of sodium hydroxide. Let's add more. Look, it's very thick material, a lot of precipitate there. What is next, Mike? Let's do on this one, yes, we have the precipitate and we add hydrochloric acid. What concentration? Six molar should work, right? Uh, six molar, yeah. Yeah. So we have hydroxide here. Uh, it's a precipitate. Um, we should dissolve it using uh, strong acid, like hydrochloric acid. Let's see if we can dissolve it using the acid. Yeah, it seems like it's dissolving a little bit. Going backwards? Yeah. Yeah, you can see here, it starts to dissolve already. Yes, definitely it's dissolving. So we can bring the reaction backward. Just the reverse reaction. Now it's dissolved. Next. From your observations above, discuss how the solutions of copper So, major conclusions based on the observations.